BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello. Before you listen to this podcast from the BBC, great choice by the way, I'm Amanda Litherland and I want to tell you about Podcast Radio Hour. Each week we recommend some of the best podcasts out there, whether they're true crime, comedy or something completely different. And we interview podcast creators about the inspirations behind their episodes. Find your next favourite with Podcast Radio Hour. But first, enjoy this. Hi, I'm Rihanna Dillon. Welcome to Seriously. No matter where you are, get ready for a listening delight from BBC Radio 4. This is really a story of the mainstream being attacked by everything that isn't itself. You know, if someone wants to go down the street, you know, chanting racist epithets and all that, they have the right to do that. Racism, misogyny, at the centre of our political culture. Prepare to get... This is a documentary that shouldn't exist, according to the people it's about. They say that the old media has deliberately shut them out. They say that the reason they exist at all is because the mainstream media has lost its way, is too reactive, intellectually dishonest, a slave to the dead hand of political correctness. While mainstream journalists scan Twitter for their news morsels, just out of their eyeline, over on YouTube, something vast has been brewing. A new breed of homespun political commentator. Not always pretty, provocative in tone, uncompromising in content. The more you blithely regurgitate the same brain-dead progressive cliches, the less people care. Is radical feminism a refuge for fat, ugly women? The stereotype generally holds true. They look like swamp donkeys. That's Paul Joseph Watson. His YouTube bio says simply, Culture, Controversy, Contrarianism. He has 1.4 million YouTube subscribers. He gets 500,000 views per video. For reference, that's about the same as an episode of Newsnight. He has more Twitter followers than any UK journalist, more than Andrew Neil, more than Laura Koonsberg or Nick Robinson. Once, Paul Joseph Watson ran his channel from his mum's house. Now, he has a very big flat in London. Hello everyone, I'm interviewing Steve Bannon. We are raising the alarm now, because we know that ultimately you want us all gone. That is Sargon of a Cat. Real name, Carl Benjamin, a 38-year-old father of two who broadcasts from his garage in Swindon. Pithy, angry, intellectual carve-ups of his enemies, social justice and progressive politics. He has 850,000 YouTube subscribers. Hello, my dudes. I'm here to tell you a secret that communists don't want you to know. Just as soon as this beat drops. That's Count Dankula. He has 380,000 YouTube subscribers. For reference, The Guardian's star journalist, Owen Jones, has 113,000. Together, they're the leading lights in what they'd call the alternative media, a new street-fighting commentariat who've made their own audiences from nothing but their capacity to pull people in. I'm Gavin Haynes. Over the last three years, I've been watching them slowly crawl out of the internet swamps and evolve themselves into a force that, I believe, now needs to be taken seriously. They're all on the right. They style themselves as classical liberals. All three have courted controversy, and controversy has found them. Count Dankula has a hate crime conviction. Sargon of Akkad is banned from Twitter. Paul Joseph Watson is closely associated with the ranting American Infowars kingpin Alex Jones. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! Recently banned from almost every social media platform going. All have voiced support for Tommy Robinson, former leader of far-right English Defence League. But one reason you still might not have heard of these people is that, while Twitter has become a parlour of the left wing, YouTube is increasingly a bastion of the right. Out there, the talk is of the biological basis of gender, the economic fallacies of mass migration, the moral bankruptcy of the Davos elite. Carl Miller runs the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media at the Demos think tank. He's watched the narratives come apart. It might be new to many, but it's definitely not new. 
This has been happening much longer than I think most of us recognise. It's been long sailing under the radar of the mainstream establishment. Um, already in 2000, you can see on hacker forums, on, on places like 4chan, you already see the kind of fermenting subculture beginning to emerge. Already they're, they're railing and raging against what they regard to be the shackles of mainstream politics. And already they're building both a narrative and account which is an alternative to it. Already they're building almost a manifesto, really, of what they really want to replace progressive politics with. This matters because YouTube is increasingly TV. Run the numbers. 92% of 18 to 25 year olds get their news from the internet, 8% from traditional telly. 25 to 35, 62% from the internet. In short, there's an iceberg coming. What we think of as the mainstream is about to be thinned out by the passage of time. What we thought was the tail is about to become the dog. This new online right wing has no name and many. The intellectual dark web, classical liberals, internet libertarians, edgelords. It has a problem defining itself because, in many ways, its credo is oppositional. They oppose an emergent mainstream consensus on what's known as identity politics. They hate all curbs on free speech. They reject most ideas of globalism. Which would make Ash Sarkar of hard left online portal Navara Media their natural foe. Sarkar is most famous for telling Good Morning Britain presenter Piers Morgan that she was a literal communist. So she sits at the exact other end of the spectrum. These people might present themselves like jokes, but their ambitions are very, very serious indeed. They're not content to remain at the margins of the outer edges of the internet. They want to dominate our streets. And unless we want to see the most egregious forms of racism, misogyny at the very centre of our political culture, then we need to fight them very, very seriously. Well, you should see what they say about her. And that really is what we have here. There's a culture war going on. It's nasty, brutish and very, very long. Out there in the corners of the internet, two distinct ideological lenses are being shone on the same events, each vying for media supremacy. I've just stepped off the train in Swindon, Wiltshire, where I'm about to go and meet a man called Carl Benjamin, who goes by the name Sargon of Akkad on the internet. He is the only figure from this movement to so far have agreed to meet with us. The others seem somewhat publicity shy when it comes to the mainstream media. He's at a pub just down the road, so let's head there now. Hi, Carl. Gavin, BBC. If you had to boil it down, what do you stand for? I stand for English liberalism as opposed to various collectivist strains of continental ideology that are trying to centralise power away from the average person within this country. The, the driving goal of liberalism and, and English political tradition was to decentralise power and hold power to account. That British liberalism means treating people as ends in themselves rather than means to an end, a principle Sargon of Akkad feels we've abandoned. Classical liberals say that they care about the rules above all. They say they care about equality of opportunity and leave equality of outcome to sort itself out. But politicians are more pragmatic. In Britain, affirmative action is now authorised under the 2010 Equalities Act. And in recent years, the talk is of identity, gender audits and systemic racism. Things that Sargon of Akkad stands in stout opposition to. But does that mean there is no problem? I wanted to know how prevalent he thought racial discrimination is in the UK. Institutionally, there is no racial discrimination against non-white people, for example. Racial discrimination has been institutionalised in our country, but it's not against non-white people. White men are the ones who are failing in this society, and they're doing it because there are various kind of affirmative action programmes to promote non-white people at their expense. It's not that I want to see any kind of racial discrimination, but it has been institutionalised. Sargon of Akkad feels that saying these things means that he has railroaded out the broader debate. There's a chilling effect. But I wondered whether his version of liberalism accepted that other minority voices could also be pushed out. I am the vulnerable minority. I am the person who's not being served by the current media landscape. The media landscape are serving all manner of people who say all manner of ridiculous things along various identitarian categories, decrying all white people as racist, all men as sexist, the very nature of being female to be oppression. 
I am the minority that has had to build up a large presence on the internet and break into the mainstream using it by just having so many voices behind me, you can't ignore me anymore. I am the vulnerable minority is certainly a t-shirt campaign to rival this is what a feminist looks like. Harder to get the body shop to stock it, true, but it's precisely that capacity to speak to a demographic that feels shut out that makes his audience so loyal, so fanish. It's what allows him to now make £10,000 a month from his audience sponsorship. His YouTube advertising revenue possibly doubles that amount. That level of popularity confers its own kind of legitimacy, but the mainstream media still treat him warily. Particularly after a 2016 tweet in which he told Labour MP Jess Phillips that he, quote, wouldn't even rape her. Here's Carl Miller, a research director at Demos. The, the question of how, quite how legitimate Sargon of Akkad actually is is a really difficult one. On the one hand, I've long thought and long argued that the, the kind of ideas that should be present available to people in mainstream politics should be wider than they are. But on the other, there is this genuine fear, I think, that you have kind of dangerous, like incredibly divisive ideas currently being kind of repackaged, rebranded, um, in order to deliberately appeal to, to more mainstream audiences. So I think it's really tough to know quite how legitimate he is, but I think fundamentally he should be spoken to because he's speaking to lots of people. It's indicative of how culture wars are gloves off. While he may preach centrism, Sargon of Akkad's commentary style is as often a 90s pro wrestling body slam on his opponents. I asked him, is that not a touch hypocritical? I didn't snout the fire. I wasn't the one who decided that race and gender were perfectly acceptable ways to attack people, and I wasn't the one who called all white people racist. I am responding to what I'm being given. I'm more than happy to have a nice, polite conversation with someone like this, but if people are going to tell me that I am a bad person because I am white, I am liberal, I am pro-capitalism, I am pro-Britain, then I don't feel that I should have to hold back just because they don't realise that they're on the wrong side of the argument. They call me a Nazi to the entire country on a near daily basis. He didn't start the fire. Over and again, the complaint from his side was that the left had somehow gone mad, that our subjects had stayed the same while the mainstream culture had pivoted around them. I didn't want to tell anyone that this could be diagnosed as a traditional midlife slump into Toryism, but the left left me was by now a familiar refrain. The left hasn't left Hella Lewis of the New Statesman, but it's certainly slammed a few doors behind her. As what she calls the middle left, she's butted up against the new wave, who are Sargon of Akkad's mortal foes, and against his allies. In other words, she was stuck in culture wars no man's land. I asked Helen whether she felt there'd been an own goal, whether the new right had been nurtured by what the identity politics obsessed left had done over the past few years. I think it's very easy to talk about the left is obsessed with identity politics, but the fact is that everybody is obsessed with identity politics. They just don't see their own form of politics as identity politics. Previously dominant groups are now feeling under threat. And I think that's why you see a lot of this intellectual dark web is is white men because they were you know they now feel under attack and under challenge because they feel that someone else is making the rules of the game, not them. And, you know, guess what? It's really horrible being in that position. And it's something that, you know, the feminist movement, the civil rights movement has said for years. And they're getting now a, a taste of that too. Yet the likes of Paul Joseph Watson and Sargon of Akkad have made hay mocking the extremes of progressive social justice warrior culture with its stackable hierarchies of victims, its unending tone policing. The phrase oppression Olympics dates back to the culture wars of the early 90s, but Helen Lewis thinks it cuts both ways. I think what's really important to it is that some of the people within this movement kind of almost want to be oppressed, they want to be silenced, they want to shut down. That is absolutely vital to what they're selling. I think they just believe in free speech for them and they translate that as being able to say what they want without anybody reacting badly to it. Perhaps the point is that they'd like to be able to say it despite the bad reactions. Who gets to decide what is a bad reaction and what happens next is a point they can test. The founder of classical liberalism, John Stuart Mill, was a free speech almost absolutist who believed that even the most consensus arguments should be constantly challenged or else they became mere hollow platitudes. That point came into focus late last year with the arrest and prosecution in Glasgow of a man called Mark Meachin, known on YouTube as Count Dankula. Did you hear about this Count Dankula? And he's a proud poster. He's one of those guys. And last month he was found guilty of a hate crime. Have you seen the video? 
pull up the video. My girlfriend is always ranting and raving about how cute and adorable her wee dog is. And so I thought I would turn them into the least cute thing that I could think of, which is a Nazi. Buddha, do you want to cast the juice? This video, uploaded to Count Dankula's YouTube channel, shows him training his girlfriend's cute pug to Zig Heil and asking him if he wants to gas the Jews. He was convicted of being grossly offensive under the 2003 Communications Act and fined £800. The judge also described the act as racist. I'm not racist, by the way. But Count Dankula launched a crowdfunding campaign for his appeal and raised £195,000. He lost and now says he will refuse to pay his fine meaning jail time and social media martyrdom. The case quickly became a cause célèbre for the online right. Somehow, free speech became the weaponized center of the culture wars. It also showed how much the online right's differing sub-tribes were now networking together. Former EDL leader Tommy Robinson turned up at the courthouse, plus a range of hard right figures. Others, including comedian Ricky Gervais and the campaign group Index on Censorship, also spoke up for his right to offend. But not Ash Sarka, journalist for leftist online portal Navara Media. Here's the mistake that they make. There is a difference in UK law between freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Freedom of expression is protected by Article 10. We've got the freedom to hold opinions, to express those opinions and ideas. However, it's still subject to the law. So we don't have total freedom of speech. In America, you have got the legal freedom to call me a racial slur. In the UK, you do not. In the shrillness of the post-Trump universe, Sarka's part of the left were using the terms fascist and racist as blanket descriptions of these people. Yet if they were all that, wouldn't we have an infestation to rival the 1930s? Hate crime or not, thousands were funding Count Dankula's appeal. I wanted to find the fans. Who was pushing those like and subscribe buttons? I'm in Westbourne Grove, West London, about to go into a pub where the UK intellectual dark web meet. Negotiating access has been pretty tricky, so let's go inside and see if the rhetoric in there matches the slightly clandestine feel of the project. Oh yeah, uh, point of lager, please. The term intellectual dark web was invented on a popular YouTube political chat show, Dave Rubin's The Rubin Report. It was a group of big intellectual figures, including Canadian clinical psychologist Dr Jordan B. Peterson. Interested, they said, in having the difficult conversations, the ones that ripped up the old left-right axes, and having them in long-form, nuanced ways. Tonight, a few of their fans were getting together, in homage. Twelve fresh disciples clustered around a long table. They were diverse, ideologically. They were also Polish, Chinese, a truck driver, a barrister, occasionally a woman. Few wanted to speak on the record and there was a strange touch and go moment with some of them in a corridor where I wondered if I was about to be expelled. My name is Benedict. Benedict is a former Marxist and vegan activist who voted Remain and deplores Trump. But for him, it was the extreme reaction of his liberal fellow travellers to Trump and Brexit that sparked a major rethink. I decided to found this meal group because uh, a lot of my personal friends weren't very comfortable talking about things like race or gender or uh, immigration and meant that I had to, uh, in order to express myself authentically, I had to find a different group of people to hang out with. What are the things that bring these people together then? I mean, there seems to be a, a movement that's defined by its oppositionalism. Is there a core manifesto? No, I don't think there is a, a, real, a real core to it that, that has a positive at the moment, which is quite interesting. It's, it's more of a negative quality in that we are almost forced together through what we don't want to submit to, which is political orthodoxy. Uh, my name is Cornelius, I'm 27, uh, I'm from Yorkshire, and I work as a jazz musician. He looks like a jazz musician too. Flaming red hair in a ponytail, Yorkshire tan, goatee, big friendly smile. Cornelius said he was still on the left, so I wanted to know what his friends thought of him being there. I, I definitely wouldn't have told that some of my friends. Um, knowing me, they might have been giving me a chance, giving me the benefit of the doubt, but um, they would be uncomfortable to learn that I was associated with certain names that are associated with this group. It's become 
become a bit of a cliche in this world to say the left left me. Is that your position too? Um, I've been quite lefty all my life, but um, I find myself hanging out in groups that the media like to label as right or whatever. I'm still a leftist. I still have the same beliefs, but uh, they're not represented on the left. So I'm a bit of a refugee in that in that case. If the left wants to come back to reason, I'm right there. But where were all the right wingers? It's not a representative sample, but I'd mainly met disaffected leftists. And I was just as struck by the fact that they were not so much talking about politics as meta-talking about what was broken with politics. Here's Carl Miller again. I think there's one narrative here, which is that um, we as a nation have changed our opinions about things like feminism and Islamophobia and progressive politics generally. I don't think that's what's happened at all. I essentially think what's happened is that in all likelihood, these opinions have been lingering in the background, denied entry to the mainstream for a very long time, and now suddenly these people can make their appeals to those kind of constituencies for the first time really in an effective and meaningful way. And that is a function of technology then? It's almost like the the medium has driven the message in this case? Technology doesn't make political change. People make political change, but technology does change what people are able to do. And and the monopolies um, that mainstream political parties have long held monopolies around mobilisation and mass political messaging have come tumbling down. And I think it's absolutely no no mistake that since 2012 we've seen eruptions of political mobilisations all across the political spectrum. You know, mobilisations, counter-mobilisations. You've got feminists and then you've got the whole manosphere. You've got Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter. You've got radical lefts and you've got people like Paul Joseph Watson and Sargon of Akkad. And they're all mobilising because they can all do the things that previously only the Labour and Conservative Party could do. They can get thousands of people out there on the streets, um, and I think they will increasingly. Um, They can get their message out there to millions, and if they can find a willing ear to listen, they can try and begin to change the furniture and landscape of political life. But this isn't a far-off Black Mirror future. In fact, the timelines Carl Miller is talking about are already starting to intersect. In June, Three of YouTube's biggest self-styled classical liberals announced they were joining UKIP. Sargon of Akkad, Count Dankula and Paul Joseph Watson. Finally, the online politics world was about to make contact with physical reality and through the strangest of portals. I'm in a black cab in Birmingham, just on my way to the UKIP party conference. This morning already, the interim manifesto has been announced and it would revoke hate crime legislation, ban foreign aid and create Muslim-only jails. But do they have anything controversial in store? Just pulling up now, let's find out. Hi. Uh, What's your name, sir? Uh, Gavin Haynes. The atmosphere was much slicker than when I'd last attended seven years earlier, back when UKIP were considered an eccentric footnote rather than an eccentric, clearly defined part of the political system. Outside the hall, at trestle tables, clusters of activists punted special causes. Here we have a condom with Nigel Farage's likeness in a very seductive manner. On stage, a range of speakers railed against political correctness, talked of deporting foreign criminals, scrapping the Climate Change Act and abolishing the BBC licence fee. That got the biggest cheer of the day. Let's take the case of a serial burglar called Nathan Cassidy, who was spared a jail sentence. The reason he was spared, the judge accepted that he was allergic to prison. That's Neil Hamilton, who sits in the Welsh Assembly and is deputy chair of UKIP. He was flush with success after a speech entitled A World Gone Mad. Culture wars were clearly his thing. But what did he think about Sargon of Akkad, who was addressing the conference later that day? Uh, I was impressed not just by his grasp of using the internet in order to communicate, but also for the really deep and well thought out political position that he has on all major issues. So I'm delighted that he wants to get deeply involved in UKIP. I mean, at the same time, the party does seem to be changing in some respect. It's almost a sense that they are targeting that sort of YouTube crowd. Would you say these two are a, are a good mix? Yeah, I think we, you know, we, we desperately need to get younger people involved. Count Dankula was also giving a speech just after lunch, a moment when pensioners are at their most defenceless against a beardy Scottish mosher with studs in his nose, buttons in his ears and a hate crime conviction. Some people will be against this as they feel it will give racists and hateful people the liberty to say all the hateful things that they want. Yes, that is the price you pay for freedom of speech. 
The audience seemed to love it. In fact, both sides seemed flattered by the other's acceptance. Though there's still a big schism they might not have noticed yet. Someone like Count Dankula, economically centrist and socially libertarian, represents something quite different from the Thatcherism or the social conservatism that UKIP might have been associated with in former times. Yes, they do. Uh, I'm Marcus Meakin, but I'm more better known by my YouTube name, Count Dankula. The times they are changing. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like, obviously, being pro-democracy and being pro-freedom is the way forward for any country. I feel that that's the path that it needs to go down. Yes, there might be some of the old guard. Some of them even may want to impose Christian values, which I don't believe in. But that means there's kind of a schism between you and UKIP, who are um, anti-gay marriage and uh, anti-drug legalisation. You know, is there a sense in which this younger generation actually thinks quite differently? A lot, a lot of the younger people that are joining the party now are more politically aligned with us because it's mostly us that is attracting them into it and they all are classical liberals, which we feel is the most reasonable part of the political spectrum. After our trio signed up, UKIP say they gained a further 500 members in the next two weeks. It's not totally clear whether these facts are connected or not. And either way, it's hardly Corbyn mania. But UKIP's new leader, Jared Batten, seems to have a direction in mind that harnesses the prevailing winds. His own fiercely Islamosceptic tone mirrors the vernacular of the new online right. He wants former EDL leader Tommy Robinson to join his party. It bodes well for the three, even if Sargon of Akkad maintains he doesn't want to be a politician. Perhaps that's the point. These are influence mongers who are beholden to no one. They aren't dependent on editors or subordinate to a party structure. They have their own, individually loyal audiences. And that's worth more than mere power. It's a whole new type of political actor. Carl Miller again. There's there's a general road that's been travelled down before here where you go from being purely an online movement to being one which also mobilises people in the streets and then finally you step into the maelstrom of mainstream politics. Now, it hasn't been a particularly successful road for many before and in general our electoral system will make it very, very, very hard for any of these people to actually be elected. Um, so I, I don't think the future for them is actually a future as, as formal politicians. I think it's more going to be these voices, these activists, who will be able to kind of mobilise probably people and money out there on the streets for this kind of changing cloud of politicians that they think um, best and most espouse what they, what they think is right. The internet talking back has led to an explosion of narratives. Power will never again be so centralised. So get ready for a lot more of this. In some ways, the rise of the YouTube classical liberals is a whole new thing. The sheer, charming amateurness of YouTube lends the feeling that these are your friends far away. As such, they're not politicians or even pundits. They whisper into your headphones with an intimacy that far exceeds either. Being on the outside has meant that the YouTubers have huddled together, building a loose network that now has its own ecosystem and its own baked-in assumptions. What began as a reformation is calcifying into a creed. These people aren't always pretty, but as they acknowledge, they've been brought to power by the reluctance of the mainstream media to say the unsayable. To no one's real surprise, that has meant that the unsayable has now swelled to a vast lexicon, all greedily colonised by this online id. How big they grow still depends closely on the mainstream's capacity to integrate their voices. But for all its noise and bluster, This political movement is still very young. If you compare it to the lifespan of the internet, these guys are asked Jeeves. When we get a Google, that will be a very different world. That was another seriously interesting story brought to you by BBC Radio 4. Let us know what you thought with the hashtag R4Seriously. Hello, I'm Elvin Bragg, and just before you go, I wanted to let you know about another podcast from the BBC that I think you might like. It's called In Our Time, and each week three expert academics join me to discuss ideas from culture, science, history, philosophy, religion. At the end of each podcast, there's more discussion we couldn't fit into the live programme. To subscribe to In Our Time, go to your usual podcast provider, search for In Our Time, click subscribe, and you can enjoy the programme and that extra content every week.